Hi, today we're going to be finishing up with lesson six on interpreting fiction, and we're going to talk about uh, figurative language. So figurative language refers to the words that are being used to mean something other than their actual literal meaning. So for instance, if I look out and I look up at the sky, I could say, oh, it's clear as a bell today, meaning that I don't see a cloud in the sky. In other words, clear as a bell means it's, if you hear the sound of a bell ringing, that's just a pure sound. And if I look up at the sky, I see nothing but blue sky. So writers and poets use figurative language to help paint a mental picture in the reader's mind. Instead of saying his voice was smoothing and pleasing, for example, a writer might say, his voice was like velvet, or his voice was velvety smooth. Figurative language often compares two different things. Sometimes the comparison is signaled by the words like or as, but not always. A writer might also say his voice was velvet. Another favorite technique of writers and poets is to give a human characteristic to something non-human. So they're saying, in literary terms, this is called personification. It's giving human characteristics to something that isn't human. So in this case, they're saying the wind sighed. Well, the wind can't sigh because it's not a person. There is, wind does not sigh, but you would have a sense of what that meant. If the wind sighed, you'd get a feeling for, for what the author was trying to convey. So it says, as you read this poem, look for figurative language and what it might mean. So let's go ahead and read the school children poem here, which is from The House on Marshland from the first four books by Louise Gluck. And this was copyrighted in a lot of different years, the latest one being 1995. The children go forward with their little satchels and all morning the mothers have labored to gather the late apples, red and gold, like words of another language. And on the other shore are those who wait behind great desks to receive these offerings. How orderly they are, the nails on which the children hang their overcoats of blue and blue or yellow wool. And the teachers shall instruct them in silence and the mothers shall scour the orchards for a way out, drawing to themselves the gray limbs of the fruit trees bearing so little ammunition. So the first question they have here is, what is suggested by comparing apples to words of another language in the fourth line? So it says, all, and all morning the mothers have labored to gather the late apples red and gold like words of another language. So the first answer is a sense of strangeness, not a part of one's world or useless things that have no meaning. What the author is trying to convey here is that these, that the children, that these People are sending their children to school and it seems as though they're going to a foreign land and that they're sending them off to a place that is strange to them that you know that is not part of their particular world so in this particular case words of another language it says a language different from your own can seem strange and remove the mothers feel removed from the world of teachers and school children and we'll see that actually in the next stanza also so a sense of strange is not part of one's world is the correct answer in this case and um, the second question is what does the word shore in the fifth line refer to and on the other shore are those who wait behind great desks so what they're talking about is their children making this transition between being in the environment with the mother and actually transporting themselves off to a different shore, meaning in this case, the far, it's not the farthest edge of the lake, which of course would be a shore, but that's not really that what this author is alluding to. They're alluding to the idea that these children are going off to a place that the mothers are not familiar with at all and that it's you know the world of the classroom is the thing that that is described later on in the poem so the mothers are sending their children off to a different shore to 
learn something that's completely foreign and strange to them. So in this case, uh, the second answer is going to be correct, the world of the classroom. So now let's take a look at, um, I found some information about uh, so I found some information online about applying figurative language to test questions. I found this at a website online, which I thought had some really good information about how to uh, look at this kind of an issue because I suspect on the GED test you're going to have an opportunity to read either a poem or something where you're going to have to uh, going to have to you know interpret some kind of figurative language. So they say in here that there are a couple of examples like what does the personification in sentence four suggest or this, these might be typical questions, or why might the author have used a particular word in paragraph two or whatever. So there's that word personification uh, that I mentioned earlier. So personification means that you're giving characteristics of people to things that are inanimate or that are not human. So what they talk about here is that understanding how to apply figurative language means that uh, you have to understand the choices that authors are making when they're trying to describe something to you. And sometimes they're not going to use literal language, they're going to use figurative. And so this figurative language is used as a way for words to appear as something other than their literal meaning. And one uh, technique is through use of similes, and similes use like or as to make a comparison between two unlike things. Chances are good that you hear cliched similes every day, below are some common examples. So snug as a bug in a rug, we use this phrase to explain how comfortable someone is by comparing it to a small bug nestled in a rug. And uh, from the, um, from Forrest Gump, they have an example here. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you get. Well, when you think about it, you open up a box of chocolates. I don't know if you've ever done this, but you pick one out and you, you can tell a little bit by the shape, but you don't exactly know what you're gonna find, if it's gonna be an almond in the center or if it's gonna be a cherry or something else. So it says that we use this to compare the uncertainty of life to the uncertainty of choosing a random chocolate from a box. And then they also talk about another common figurative language tool for uh, authors is to use a metaphor. And a metaphor is simply a comparison of two unlike things. On the drive home from work, the highway was a parking lot. What does that mean? It wasn't literally a parking lot. We didn't park on the freeway and make it into a parking lot. But what they're referring to here is sometimes you get on the freeway and if the freeway stopped up and you know it was either moving at a snail's pace or if it wasn't moving at all, you say, oh gosh, my commute home was terrible. The freeway was a parking lot, meaning it wasn't really going any place or that the traffic was caught in a standstill. Uh, we don't end up having that too much on our freeway system here, but I uh, remember the days in Seattle when if you headed down I-5 at four o'clock in the afternoon, there were many, many times when you were, you were in a parking lot. And then they talk a little bit about personification. When an author uses personification, they assign human characteristics to something that is not human. And then they give us an example. So I'd like to walk through this example just so we get an idea of um, you know, how this might occur, you know, how you might see this in a test, and they have a pretty good example here. So the storyline is, when I arrived at the station, I was overcome by the noise. The train exited abruptly behind me, leaving a cloud of smoke to sit beside me in the heavy heat. A family with mocha hair and thrilled smiles embraced one another, arms entangled like the spaghetti they would have for dinner later tonight. A man with a dog reads the station time. His dog panted in short breaths, puff, puff. 
puff, puff, a locomotive releasing steam to travel. Even animals were keenly aware of the rising temperatures of the season. I felt comforted by his natural instincts. Despite the heat, people stood closely to one another as they waited for the train. Watching them from my bench, I felt relief that my train travels had ended for now. There were sardines in a can and I was happy to be admiring, to be admiring distance. I tried to acquaint myself with the culture around me. I had been planning my trip to Rome for three years, and now that I was here, I was I more than I was uh, I was more than excited by my dream. I pulled my travel book from the front pouch of my hiking bag. I ruffled through some pages, then placed it back in my bag. It was too hot to make a decision, so I stood and began down the street. According to the map I had consulted on the train, my hostel was only three blocks from the station. I read a street sign named after a historical figure and walked down the street. My adventure was finally beginning, and I was ready for what was to come. So why is the simile in sentence three important to the passage? The simile here, it's labeled right here. So what is the simile that's in this? Family with mocha hair and thrilled smiles embraced one another, arms entangled like the spaghetti. So this actually, why is the simile? The simile is arms entangled like the spaghetti they would have for dinner later tonight. In other words, if you saw somebody and their arms were entangled like spaghetti, you would see that they were embracing each other, um, you know, like the strands of spaghetti in a bowl. And why is that important to the passage? Well, the first thing that you might notice is that he's traveling, he's in Rome, he's in a, he's in a unfamiliar place because he, and you can gather that because he's going to be staying in a hostel. He's not going to visit someone specific. It doesn't sound like because he's not staying with someone, he's actually traveling. And he has, um, he has, you know, he's saying that he's on an adventure. So my assumption here, just from reading this story is that he's traveling and this is the first time he's been there. So what does this simile in the passage do? It A, gives a cultural influence to the setting, B, it tells us that they are very skinny and need to eat well. Typically, you're not going to use figurative language to describe something quite as literal as that. And it offers important information to the character description of the main character. Well, it's not really offering information about the main character, but it is offering information about the people that he is, in, is encountering in the city where he is visiting. And so A, it gives a cultural influence to the setting. It tells you how people are behaving who live there who are part of the culture of this particular city. So A is going to be the correct answer. Uh, in sentence four, the dog is being compared to what? Well, let's look back and see. So a uh, man with a dog reads the station time. His dog panted. Let's look back here. So what does it say? His dog panted in short breaths, puff, 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 a locomotive releasing steam to travel. Well, the dog is being compared to a locomotive releasing steam to travel. So he's panting because of the heat. So the dog in this case is being compared to a train, to item B, a train. It's not being compared to the heat. It's not being compared to his owner. It's actually being called the locomotive and he's puffing like a locomotive would puff. And then the third question here is in sentence 10, they were sardines, there they were sardines in a can, and I was happy to be admiring them from a distance is an effective use of a metaphor because A, it describes, it helps describe the author's intention for coming to Rome. Well, it doesn't really describe his intention because it doesn't. It gives you more a description of what it's like to be in Rome, but not his intention or his reason for coming. He didn't come to Rome to be, uh, you know, to be a sardine in a can. It explains why the author doesn't respect the culture he's visiting. Well, he doesn't show any disrespect. He's just 
describing the situation. It's not as though he, he's making any disparaging remarks about it. He's just kind of personally happy. He doesn't have to experience that because he knows that his problem is over for a while. And see, it gives the reader a clear visual image of the people and the setting. So what it does in this case is that, you know, if you say it's like sardines in a can, you have a pretty good feeling for the fact that people are kind of put into a very close space and you know this may or may not be something that the author is comfortable with but at least he's giving a description of what you know what the general culture is like in this particular situation that he's in so this is uh, an example of the kind of questions that you will be seeing on the test. And then they also provide a last question. And I was going to go ahead and go through this example uh, so that you can have one more example of what you might see. Uh, in both of these examples here, you know, I gave you one example of a text that you might see, but both of the examples in the in the Kaplan were uh, poetry examples. So I wanted to give you Kind of a variety of what you might run into. So this is an excerpt from a story called Lunch on the Grass, and I am not French, so I will not attempt to uh, tell you what that is in French. It's pleasant to board the ferry in the sunscape as the late light slants into afternoon. The faint wind, wind ruffles the river rimmed with foam. We move through the aisles of bamboo towards the cool water lilies. The young dandies drop ice into the drinks while the girls slice the succulent lotus root. Above us, a patch of cloud spreads, darkening like a water stain on silk. Write this down quickly before the rain. Don't sit there. The cushions were soaked by the shower. Already the girls have drenched their crimson skirts, beauties, their powder streaked with mascara, lament their ruined faces. The wind batters our boat. The mooring line has rubbed a wound in the, hollow, in the willow bark. The edges of the curtains are embroidered by river foam. Like a knife in a melon, autumn slices summer. It will be cold going back. So the first question I have is, what is compared to a water stain on silk in stanza two? So stanza two is this stanza right here. So a water stain on silk. So it says above us, a patch of clouds spreads, darkening like a water stain on silk. Above us, a patch of clouds. So the foam on the edge of the river, no, rain clouds approaching. Ah, a patch of clouds, rain clouds approaching. So I believe B in this case is going to be the correct answer. Uh, the rest of these items are mentioned in this. You know, they say the young dandies drop ice into the drinks, but that doesn't have anything to do with a patch of clouds darkening like a water stain on silk. So they give you a lot of red herrings here in this answer to see if you understand that the water stain on silk is referring to the to the rain clouds above, the rain clouds that are approaching. So B in this case is going to be the correct answer. The second question is what is meant by the statement lament their ruined faces in stanza four? So stanza four, stanza four is this one. Beauties, their powder streaked with mascara, lament their ruined faces. Well, what happens when you, um, if you have mascara in your face or powder on your face and you get caught in a rainstorm, you'll see, you know, the mascara coming down on your face. So they're talking about lament their or regret their ruined faces. So they're kind of sad that, oh, the rain has ruined the, the mascara or the powder on their faces. So. What is the what is meant by the statement lament their ruined faces they could no longer smile what doesn't really imply they can't smile but or that they were growing old but that the rain has caused their makeup to run so in this case uh, the rain has caused their makeup to run and 
they were soaked by a shower, they were drenched, so it's pretty, pretty obvious that C is going to be the correct answer in this case. Uh, number three is why is the edges of the curtain are embroidered by the river foam an effective use of figurative language? Well, let's take a look at stanza five. The wind batters our boat. The mooring line has rubbed a wound in the willow bark. The edges of the curtains are embroidered by river foam. Well, what happens if you, if you leave your window open and the wind is blowing? It says the wind batters our boat. So you know that it's a description of how powerful the wind is, it's causing the foam that they talked about earlier to actually end up on uh, the curtains that are, uh, that are in the window. So let's see if we can figure out why is it an effective use of figurative language. It helps the readers see that the people forgot to close the windows and curtains. Well, yes, it does help to to tell you that, but let's see what else they say. The wind is so strong that it is blowing spray from the river into the boat. Well, that's really what's happening here is it's telling you that effectively the wind is so strong that all of a sudden you have foam blowing in, blowing into the window and it is actually uh, attaching itself to the curtain. So it looks like there's embroidery along, but instead of being embroidered, it's embroidered with foam. Uh, the curtains are beautifully edged with lace. That's not really what this is referring to. And the river is rising quickly. Well, this isn't, this doesn't really have anything to do with the river rising. It has to do with the wind and the foam in the river. So again, we can say that um, this is really helping you understand that the wind is so strong that it is blowing spray from the river into the boat. That's really what this is referring to. Um, and then, uh, let's see, question four. According to the speaker, how was the change from summer to autumn in stanza six? Like a knife in a melon, autumn slices summer. So what they're saying is like a knife in a melon. Well, how does a knife go through a melon? If it's a sharp knife, it's going to go through without any resistance. So what they're implying here is that autumn is slicing through summer very easily. And it's, you know, you, you're going to see that the weather is going to change because it happens quite abruptly. So what do we have here? Quick and easy. Yes, a knife slips, slices through a melon very quickly and very easily. Halting and uncertain? No, a knife does not go through a mill in, in any way, in an uncertain way. Slow and predictable? A knife does not go through a mill in, in any way, shape, or form in a slow way. It may go through predictably, but even that you're not absolutely sure of. And pleasant and smooth? They're not really implying that this is a pleasant transition. They're implying that this is a quick and easy transition that autumn slices through summer. So in this case, A is going to be the correct answer for number four. And the question number five is, which of the following words best describe the tone of this poem? This is more complicated because you know the, um, there are lots of ways to look at poems and I think there's a lot of individual interpretation. And I know that in this case, C, Rye and Observant is actually the correct answer. But these can be somewhat difficult to figure out because uh, gentle and calm, while I don't think that this is really a gentle, Poem. I mean, he uses some language, he or she uses the she. So she does not use language that is necessarily gentle and calm. You have a, a wind that's blowing hard, you have a rainstorm that comes through, those aren't gentle and calm uh, terms. So A, I would say we could eliminate. Humorous and playful, well, one of the things I thought here is it says, don't sit there, the cushions were soaked by the shower. Well, I don't know, that's not really humorous and playful, but it's not really serious either. So that was, I contemplated that one, that answer, and C is why and observant. 
and they report in the you know in the key that Ryan observant is the is the correct answer in this case and dry and formal it's not really a formal piece there is some there is some humor about it uh, so they're reporting that Ryan observant and it is you know observant what does that mean it means somebody's paying attention to the details and in this case yes I would say that this poem is paying attention to the details it's talking about the ruffles you know the faint wind ruffles the river rimmed with foam so there's a lot of detail in this so I would say observant or paying attention to the details is in fact true in this case and so they are reporting that C would be the correct answer in this case so um, that's the end of the fiction section and the figurative language section and so in our next section, we are going to start working on uh, the nonfiction writing, which is the majority of the reading language arts GED test. And we're going to start off with um, just talking about uh, topics and we're gonna get going on the nonfiction and we're going to be reading many other stories uh, with questions so that we get a chance to read lots of different nonfiction materials because my understanding is the test is going to include many different kinds of nonfiction reading, whether, whether it might be something you would see in a textbook, something you might see in an office setting, something you might see at a, on a factory floor trying to interpret some kind of instructions. And uh, we're going to look at news articles. So we're going to look at lots of different kinds of nonfiction writing and see if we can figure out how what's what's a good plan for trying to figure out how those work so i'm going to include the next two units in the khan academy here i'm going to attach those so you'll have nouns and i believe let's see those are going to be uh irregular nouns and trying to form plurals so i just want to give you the basis of you know starting to build the tools because eventually we're going to start building phrases and then we're clauses and phrases and then we're going to start building sentences and of course at the end of this to get ready for the the essay part of the exam you will be writing paragraphs and at that point i want you to have a pretty good idea of how to do you know the basic punctuation how to build sentences without having to to uh, you know go back and review that so uh Again, that's the end of the fiction section, and we will start nonfiction in the next unit. So uh, have a good day.